Many people have an unspoken flock rule. Wherever they go, they go together. This is particularly true for many female friend groups, whether that's going to a public bathroom in a restaurant or a club or going home late at night. Many people just feel safer that way. This is particularly true when you're in a location that you're not too familiar with. But what happens when a woman familiar with an area leaves alone in broad daylight? Well, it's considered safe. Or is it? 27-year-old Vanessa Marco thought that she was safe when she went for a jog on a Sunday afternoon on August 7th of 2016 on a familiar trail very close to her mother's home. Everyone thought that Vanessa would leave and come back very soon. But when afternoon darkened into the evening and there was still no sign of Vanessa, her family and the community of Princeton, Massachusetts weren't expecting Vanessa's body to be found half a mile from her home. The case of Vanessa Marco is a petrifying example of danger being anywhere at any time. A case that took almost six years to reach completion is grueling and baffling and leaves many women all over the world feeling unsafe, even in places that they know like the back of their hand. If you're watching this video, that means you're probably interested in true crime. And if you're interested in true crime, then I'd be willing to bet you'd be interested in this channel, True Crime Stories. So do me a quick favor and hit that subscribe button below if you haven't already. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future cases. Vanessa Teresa Marco was born on June 17th, 1989. Vanessa was an only child. She did exceptionally well in school. She loved playing sports and was an avid adventure seeker. Vanessa loved spending time in nature and in the outdoors, and she was very active. Vanessa and her family even took vacations to several beaches, mountains, and resorts, and she loved connecting with nature. Vanessa also was a kind-hearted girl with a love generally for life. Her family and friends defined her as a person that they could really rely on. Vanessa was also very responsible and loved helping and was fond of her family. On the outside, Vanessa had the perfect life, but that wouldn't last for too long. See, Vanessa's parents, while she was still young, decided to call it quits on their marriage. Things weren't working out, and their once loving marriage had run its course in their eyes. Now, this was a major change for Vanessa, and you would think that it would have had a massive impact on her emotional stability. But Vanessa, even after her parents divorced, was super close to them both. Yes, they weren't together and Vanessa knew that their family dynamic had changed forever, but even so, she was still the bubbly, outgoing, and loving person that everyone knew her as. But let's be honest, grief comes in many colors. None of us really know what sort of darkness may have been lingering beneath the surface. Fast forward to graduating from high school, Vanessa attended Boston University and pursued a degree in communication there. Vanessa loved and excelled at her major so much so that she graduated with honors in 2011 and got a job straight out of university. After graduating from college, Vanessa worked at WordStream, an online marketing software company. Not only this, she worked at Vistaprint to gain experience in the corporate industry and the communication business. That's because she had a bigger goal and wanted to get her hands on her dream job. See, Vanessa saw herself working for the tech giant Google, and to her surprise, she soon got the jobs she so desperately wanted in 2015. Vanessa moved to New York City to work as an account manager at Google. She was over the moon when she got the opportunity, although that did mean that she had to move away from her family to chase her dream, which was certainly a bit of a tragic decision for her. For Vanessa, that was a gutting feeling because as an only child, she loved her family and wanted to spend as much time with them as possible but she also wanted to start her professional journey in her dream company. Despite being extremely busy with her job in New York, Vanessa always made bi-monthly visits to Princeton, Massachusetts to visit her mother and her aunt. Vanessa's mother, Rosanna, really looked forward to these meetings. And in August of 2016, she was beyond excited to see her daughter again. Princeton was a very tiny rural town tucked away in Worcester County. It had a population of just under 3,500 people so it was a town where everyone knew everyone. It was also a relatively safe town, so much so that the last major recorded criminal activity occurred almost 30 years ago, 
So it's safe to say that Princeton was a town that was secure for anyone. But that would soon change in the most horrific way, when this quaint town became a haunting and terrifying place, and the whole community was shocked to their core. On August 7th, 2016, while staying over at her mother's house, Vanessa went out for a run. It was an ordinary Sunday, and later that day, Vanessa had to catch a bus to go back to New York to get started with yet another busy work week. Vanessa still had some unpacking left, but could never say no to a run. Being athletic, Vanessa loved to do yoga, run, and take jogs during the day to get her workout in. And August 7th was no exception. Vanessa's mother's home was on Brook Station Road, close to a walking trail. 27-year-old Vanessa left her mother's house in the early afternoon for her daily jog. Now, this wasn't something out of the ordinary for Vanessa. She was always going to jog on this trail whenever she came to visit her mother. But the afternoon turned to evening, and there was still no sign of Vanessa's return. She wasn't picking up her phone, and Rosanna got worried, since Vanessa still had to pack and leave to catch her bus for New York on time. This behavior was extremely out of the ordinary for Vanessa. She was a responsible woman who was never late and didn't have a habit of forgetting important things. So Vanessa's disappearance in silence started eating away at Rosanna. By the evening, Rosanna called the police and Vanessa was officially a missing person. Right from the get-go, the police were active in the search for Vanessa. This is a small town we're talking about, and if Vanessa were somewhere injured and in dire need of help, the police would do everything to get to her on time. There were civilians, police officers, and even canine units trying to look for Vanessa. The police wanted to search the area where Vanessa went, aka the jogging trail, as it was heavily wooded and had dense vegetation the deeper the woods went. At around 8.20 p.m., even though it was getting dark, the search for Vanessa was still on. This was until one of the police dogs picked up a scent trail that led the officers to the most unexpected and tragic scene that they'd been to in over 30 years. Just off the street, less than half a mile away from Vanessa's mother's home, a body was found in the woods. It was the lifeless body of a woman who was completely disrobed, had burn marks on her limbs, face, and stomach, and had unfortunately also been assaulted violently. Upon closer inspection, a discarded and partially burned running shoe was also found near the body. There were also injuries to her neck, which were later helpful in figuring out the cause of death, which was manual strangulation. The police couldn't believe their eyes, and after identifying the body, it was confirmed to be 27-year-old Vanessa Marco. Vanessa's family was immediately informed of her passing, and her mother, in utter disbelief, was left numb from the shock and fear of the situation. Her worst nightmares had quite literally come true. Vanessa was brutally attacked and killed so close to her mother's home and on a trail on which she was very familiar. Rosanna and John were trying to make sense of the situation on how someone could hurt their precious daughter, who was doing nothing but minding her own business in her own hometown. It goes without saying that police immediately knew that this was a case of homicide, and they immediately set out to find Vanessa's killer before it was too late. By looking at the crime scene and the way the perpetrator had tried to remove any traces of evidence by lighting Vanessa's remains on fire, the police knew that it wasn't an accident. Someone had deliberately attacked Vanessa and tried to tamper with her body so that they wouldn't get caught. It was an animalistic scene, and the police knew that if they didn't catch the wrongdoer on time, then something grave like this would happen again to another woman. After sending Vanessa's body for an autopsy, a full-blown investigation soon commenced and the police were looking for any leads or clues left, right, and center. There were traces of DNA found at the crime scene, as well as on Vanessa's body, and it was sent for testing and cross-matching with the criminal database. It was also concluded that the attack on Vanessa took place between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m., so it was not long after Vanessa left her mother's house that she was fatally attacked. The place where Vanessa's body was found was secluded, a perfect place for someone with malicious intentions to carry out their dark crimes. On top of that, Vanessa's clothes, cell phone, and headphones were also missing, and it was believed that they were taken by the perpetrator in an effort to further cover their tracks. While searching the crime scene for more evidence, the police found evidence of gasoline, essentially proving that the fire had been deliberately set to cover the criminal's tracks. As Vanessa's body was being analyzed, forensic specialists also found DNA underneath Vanessa's fingernails. 
This revelation suggested that Vanessa put up a great fight to save herself, and she might have left injuries on her attacker. So police were looking for any suspects with injuries on their faces or arms, because Vanessa probably inflicted those during the final moments of her life. Also, the fact that Vanessa's body was dehumanized and left exposed gave the police a clue that the crime was indeed that of passion. The police were confident that Vanessa's attacker wasn't someone she knew. From the looks of it, it seemed as though the attack on Vanessa was random, which is just as scary. And this left the police in even more confusion as to why a person would do such a vile and evil thing. With all of this information, the police had no choice but to go and make it public, to get Vanessa's case known to everyone around them in hopes to solve it and catch the perpetrator. On August 11, 2016, four days after the discovery of Vanessa's body, Worcester District Attorney Joseph Early Jr. conducted a press conference, and in it, he told the community of Princeton to steer clear of any danger and be vigilant of any suspicious activity, because the killer was still out there at large. Detective Earl also went on to describe the general profile of the killer, based on the evidence that they found at the scene of the crime. The perpetrator was defined to be 20 to 30 years old, a male with minor cuts, bruises, and injuries as a result of the scuffle with Vanessa. As time passed, the police turned to the public for more information about the day of August 7th, and an official tip hotline was also set up. The police received hundreds of tips every single day, which totaled almost 1,300 tips entirely. Several witnesses came forward with promising leads, but two of them stood out to the police the most, and they decided to look further into them. The first witness claimed to have seen Vanessa at the Mountainside Market on Hubbardston Road at about 1 p.m. on the day that she disappeared, talking on her cell phone and drinking some water. Another witness came forward with a very eerie detail. They claimed to see a dark-colored vehicle following Vanessa down the same road she was taking a jog on. The car appeared to be making calculated movements and wasn't even being discreet about following Vanessa. Why this witness didn't report this before the crime had occurred, well, we may never know. It's likely they probably thought Vanessa knew the person. After all, this was a shockingly safe town up until this point. This revelation of Vanessa being followed was an alarming discovery for the police, and they decided to look into the car and its appearance on the horrible day of August 7th. But during their investigation, there was one suspicious detail that detectives uncovered. Since the murder of Vanessa caught a lot of media attention, it was connected to another case that had occurred not too long before Vanessa's attack, but in New York. See, there was a 30-year-old there named Karina Vetrano, who was found in a park in Queens, New York City, where she'd gone for a walk alone. There were way too many similarities between Karina and Vanessa's cases and how their bodies were found for police to write this off as a coincidence. Karina was also disrobed, dehumanized, and strangled. This left the police even more confused because Vanessa also lived and worked full-time in New York City. So did the attacker, who was responsible for Karina's death, follow Vanessa all the way to Princeton to carry out another heinous crime? The police had too many questions and time was running out. While trying to find the link that could relate Karina and Vanessa's cases together, the FBI also got involved in Vanessa's case and came forth with their own attacker profile and other information. According to the FBI, the person responsible for Vanessa's death was someone who knew the Princeton area well, or at least frequented there, because he knew the most secluded areas of Princeton, and he was aware of the neighboring stores as well. The police also received information on Vanessa's phone records, and it was found that it had been turned off at about 2.11 p.m., the same time when it was speculated that the attack on Vanessa took place, helping police to narrow down a very specific timeline. But three months after the fact, some incriminating information came forward, and it had to do with the dark-colored car which was apparently following Vanessa. See, another witness came forward and said that they saw a black Ford vehicle with its hood up parked just around the curb from where Vanessa's body was found. There was also a man in his mid-20s to 30s talking on the phone, and he appeared to be of a medium build and Hispanic. Oddly enough, when the witness passed by the same area again sometime later, the car was still there, although the hood was down and there was no sign of the driver. The police highlighted this information and a bolo was put out on this vehicle. Another three months passed by, and on February 23, 2017, 
the police came out to the public with even more information about Vanessa's attacker. So remember the DNA retrieved from Vanessa's body? Well, a criminal profile was made based on the DNA, and it was found that the attacker was most likely in his mid-20s to 30s, and he was likely of a medium build and was Hispanic. He had short hair, owned a black SUV or vehicle, and probably was from Princeton. This profile matched the description of the man that the witness saw. The press conference proved to be helpful because three weeks later, in March of 2017, a police officer who was on his usual duty spotted a man identical to the description given by the police, driving a black Ford SUV. The officer noted the vehicle's license plate number, and a name popped up when he ran the plates. And it turned out the car belonged to a man named Angelo Colon Ortiz. Thirty-one-year-old Angelo Colon Ortiz was a Puerto Rican native who lived with his family and three children in Worcester for less than a year before the police discovered his car. He worked as a delivery man for a third-party contractor of FedEx, and alarmingly, he was pretty familiar with the Princeton area as he made tons of deliveries there. Angelo was a quiet guy who did his job and did it well, but according to his neighbors and co-workers, he was defined as a very perverted man. Although he had no criminal history, Angelo had a habit of making very offensive and crude remarks about women in his native language. He sneered at women and generally made them feel uncomfortable. A female co-worker also backed up this claim by saying that Angelo once made derogatory remarks about her and another female co-worker out loud in Spanish, thinking that the women didn't understand his language, though they did. She also stated, quote, I had to interact with him on my own. Thank God nothing happened. It was very strange and uncomfortable to be around him. All of this was alarming and eerily coincidental, so the police were adamant about visiting Angelo. Angelo, being Puerto Rican, didn't understand or read or speak English, so a bilingual police officer who spoke Spanish conversed with Angelo and asked him about Vanessa and if he knew anything about her, to which he answered in the negative. Angelo also confirmed that he was not in Princeton at the time of Vanessa's attack. The police then asked for a sample of his DNA, which Angelo offered, and even signed papers that verified his consent for handing over DNA to the police. It's so crazy to me that he offered all of this up to detectives willingly. And that's because when the police compared Angelo's DNA with what was found under Vanessa's fingernails, it was a match. The police finally had their suspect. And on August 15th, 2017, almost a year after Vanessa's tragic passing, Angelo Ortiz was arrested and charged with her murder. Angelo was held on a bail of a staggering $10 million, so there was no way for him to evade the consequences of what he had done to poor Vanessa. After Angelo's arrest, his movements on the tragic day of August 7th were also tracked, and a very shocking piece of information was found. On the same day that Vanessa was attacked, Angelo was seen buying $5 worth of gasoline from a store six miles from the crime scene at about 2.35 p.m. The police suspected that Angelo had already killed Vanessa at that point, and he wanted to get rid of the evidence, which is why he bought the gasoline. If you remember, the crime scene had several traces of fire and gasoline, further corroborating this claim. While awaiting trial, police theorized that Angelo was out working his shift when he saw Vanessa jogging on the trail near her home. For whatever reason, Angelo decided to target and terrorize Vanessa, and he proceeded to subdue her lure her 60 yards into the dense forest, and then violate her. In the end, Angelo strangled Vanessa and robbed her of her cell phone, headphones, and clothes, which were never found after Angelo was arrested. It was believed that he sold the items for money. After fatally attacking Vanessa, Angelo left to buy some gasoline, proceeded to burn Vanessa's body, and left the scene. His motive for attacking Vanessa in the first place was never revealed, but it seems pretty clear to assume his motive was likely sexual. Rather than insisting that Angelo didn't commit the crime, Angelo's attorneys concocted a plan to claim that he was taken advantage of because of a language barrier and had his DNA forcefully taken by investigators. Far as I can tell, this is just straight up not true. A motion was filed on March 16, 2017 to suppress this DNA evidence presented in court, but it was denied. Angelo's trial dragged on for years because of the DNA debacle, and Angelo fired three of his lawyers. The Marco family was understandably going through immense pain and suffering all throughout this time. 
They just wanted to get justice for their daughter. But the assailant, since he wasn't pleading guilty, even though there was so much evidence against him, made it nearly impossible for the grieving family to see the end of this nightmare. Finally, on January 11, 2022, after the motion was denied, the prosecution offered a plea deal to Angelo after discussing the terms with the Marco family. On November 2, 2022, Angelo pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and robbery, and he was sentenced to life in prison with the eligibility for parole in 2067. Angelo was 36 years old at the time, which means he'll be eligible for parole when he's 81, if he even lives that long. During his sentencing, Angelo was deprived of any emotion. He was stoic and calm, which is just disgusting considering the end of the life of an innocent woman who hadn't even provoked him. He never showed any remorse, never shed a tear, and accepted his fate without a single word. Vanessa's parents went through the unthinkable, having lost their daughter in such a tragic and brutal way. What was so saddening was that Vanessa's father, John, passed away from declining health conditions just 10 days before the sentencing of Angelo. He wasn't even able to put the situation to bed before passing away, but I feel very confident that he was able to find the peace he so desperately was seeking after reuniting with his daughter. At the sentencing, Vanessa's mother and John's ex-wife, Rosanna, stated that John died of a broken heart and unbearable grief caused by Angelo. The Marco family, even though the sentencing was next to nothing compared to the loss that they endured, were satisfied that Angelo was now in prison, preventing him from ever hurting anyone else ever again. But it's hard to even wrap your head around the fact that he could have ever done this to someone in the first place. That's the thought that hurts more than anything else. This man claimed a promising young woman's life, and for what? One fleeting moment of pleasure? The Marco family is still healing every single day from this heavy loss, and they want to spread awareness for other women too. So as a tribute to their daughter, who loved all things sports and athletics, the Marco family founded the Vanessa T. Marco Foundation in 2017. It started as a platform to help find Vanessa's killer, and now it's grown into a nonprofit organization that conducts self-defense workshops and classes for women and spreads awareness against all kinds of harassment that women face on a day-to-day -day basis. This case is nothing short of a terrifying nightmare for women everywhere. Angelo and Vanessa didn't even know each other. There was no animosity or ill will for there to be a clear motive for him to brutally attack her and take her life. This man literally just saw a good-looking young woman running by and decided, yeah, I want that. Angelo was an evil man who simply wanted to terrorize a woman, any woman. From the remarks of his co-workers, he seemed like a guy who saw women as nothing more than an item to be played with and then tossed aside. Nothing more. The lack of respect is just appalling. The fact that Vanessa's attack was so random makes everything all the more chilling, and it really goes to show that there are monsters hiding in plain sight. For decades, even hundreds of years, Women have been constantly victims of harassment, catcalling, and so much worse. This is why many women tend to feel unsafe wherever they go, because cases like this can unfold at any moment in broad daylight without any level of warning. You truly never know when one day might be your last. And that's such a haunting thought if you just let that sink in for a moment. The Vanessa T. Marco Foundation has taken a huge step forward in the right direction of a formative vision to make the world a safe place for women so that they don't have to be afraid to step out of their homes for something as simple as a workout or buying groceries. I get asked all the time why I tend to cover so many more female cases than male cases. And the honest reason is because I just feel like these cases need so much more light shed on them. Men get taken advantage of every single day as well. We all know that, that's true. But the number of occurrences is vastly less when compared to how often women are victimized. And I'm not just talking about the cases like Vanessa's, where these victims lose their lives. I'm not even talking about the cases where women come forward about the abuse they endure. I'm talking about the daily occurrences that women are forced to deal with. The creepy second glances, the off-color remarks about their looks, the unwanted touches, all of it. We need to do something about this, and the Vanessa T. Marco Foundation is making great strides at helping women better learn how to identify a potential threat, as well as deal with it accordingly. But there's still a long way to go, and I can only hope that the community and law enforcement agencies as a whole can do something about predators preying on vulnerable women. 
because the world does not need a repeat of what happened to Vanessa and so many other women. It's time to stop. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to some of the new channel members, including Elisha Jacobs, Hilary Wallace, and Christine Umberger. There are so many more new members who joined this month as well, but I just wanted to pick a few at random and let you guys know how much I appreciate your support. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you can gain access to new videos, sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way you can help keep the channel afloat and help out. I'm just, I'm so grateful to all of you who've decided to do that. If you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video or find the link in the description. I'm also working on some merch ideas for those of you that want to help sport some true crimes memorabilia or accessories. So keep a close eye out for that. I'm hoping we'll be able to make an announcement about that maybe in the coming weeks. We're working on some amazing stuff that I think you guys are going to love. I'm also considering having an after credit section of each video where I answer you guys' questions regarding the channel, the cases we've covered, or even just personal things you guys may be curious about. So if you have any questions you want answered, just ask them here in the comments and you might find the answer in a future video. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered. And don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.